Ian. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Swanson. I'm a retired rheumatologist, and I have been excited about telemedicine, telehealth for a good number of years, and I have seen it expand. And we're going to have a expert today, Kayla Staley from Bronson Health Systems. She is their IT coordinator, and she also has been involved with their telemedicine program, which really began before the pandemic, but with the pandemic and people not able to get into their physicians, grew and grew and grew. And now we're interested to see how it's going to continue. Start off, today is the Ides of March. And only William Shakespeare made it a bad day when he said, you know, Cassius, beware of the Ides of March. Otherwise, this was a Roman holiday. This was also the first full moon of the month. So it's a happy day. So we're going to make this a very happy day and forget William Shakespeare. But Kayla is, a, is the IT specialist and the telemedicine coordinator at Bronson Health Systems. And she is an expert on telemedicine, how electronics are allowing us new ways of seeing our physicians. If you live in uh, Arizona and you're a small community, you may not be able to get to your doctor, but with telemedicine, you can get the quality of care that you need. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla and say, welcome, thank you for joining us at HASP, and please keep your questions to the end, and then we'll try to answer all of your questions. Kayla, it's all yours, thank you. Awesome, thanks Dr. Swanson. I am very excited to be here. Uh, as Dr. Swanson mentioned, I am uh, the IT manager at Bronson Healthcare Group. Uh, I've actually, my experience I think makes me very qualified to talk about telehealth as I uh, actually transitioned from supporting the technical pieces of telehealth uh, and, and in 2020 uh, when the pandemic hit actually took over as the operational leader of all of telehealth. Um, and now I've since um, transitioned back into the IT role and really just that ongoing um, support of virtual care delivery, uh, but also thinking beyond that and what the future of healthcare technology really looks like, uh, not only from a um, provider perspective, but from a patient perspective and from a cohesive uh, you know, care journey for our patient experience to be as optimal and digitally enabled as it can be. Uh, so I'm really going to kind of stretch you all to see uh, what, what we've done in relation to healthcare transformation over the recent years uh, and kind of where things are going and, and really highlight how that virtual care and the digital tools that are in our toolkit can really help uh, make that experience um, more powerful, more enabled, and ultimately have better care outcomes for patients. So uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, we'll just kind of level set with what is transformation. So when we talk about healthcare transformation, uh, there's really been a movement over the last, I'd say, 20 or so years to really move healthcare in a more digitally enabled way. Um, this really started in the early years with things like adopting to EHRs or electronic health records and going from paper records to EHRs. Uh, and when we've done those transitions, you know, a lot of people think that just going to digital is a transformation, but in and of itself, that's not really a transformation. Shifting a process from paper to electronic doesn't change the way that we do the work. Transformation is truly stretching us to look at the process and completely revamping it or making it look completely fresh or new in order to improve it. Uh, so yeah, we have some efficiencies when we go from paper to electronic, um, or in the, in the cases of care, right? If we go from uh, requiring our patients to come on site to being able to deliver that care electronically or virtually, that changes how it looks and feels. But in order to truly transform that, we need to do new things such as enabling those virtual care visits with things like um, wearable devices or uh, being able to enable it with uh, different communication tools like chatbots. So that's what we're kind of talking through today is how is healthcare really not just gone from, from paper to electronic or from in-person to virtual, but how is that really 
changed that care delivery model and ultimately impacted that patient experience. So I will be the first to admit that healthcare is slow to evolve. Um, this is a really great graphic that um, is a nonpartisan organization runs what they call a digital index score. And it highlights where we're at in the different kinds of sectors. So of course, media is up there on the top with being very digitally enabled. Uh, but you can see that healthcare is actually the second from the bottom uh, in this digital score. I find it interesting that things like transportation and government are actually scored higher than healthcare. And so it makes you wonder why is healthcare lagging or what is causing some of those barriers? And so a few that I just wanna highlight and kind of talk through is there are many forces that influence healthcare that are not uh, applicable in a lot of these other industries. So our payers are something that influences how quickly we transform. Um, at the start of the call, Dr. Swanson actually asked me how Medicare was uh, adapting to virtual care delivery. Uh, during the pandemic, of course, uh, many peers were allowing virtual care delivery, but that was a recent shift that was in response to the pandemic. And so we were really challenged leading up to the pandemic with how do you deliver care virtually? How do you uh, allow patients to pay their bills online uh, because we have different guidelines that we have to follow. Um, and that goes into the regulatory state as well. Um, as a healthcare organization, there are many more statutes, regulations, uh, regulatory bodies, such as the Joint Commission, uh, that, that require us to do things in a very specific um, and compliant way. Healthcare also has barriers with cash flow. Uh, we are in the business of making money. I mean, it may not feel like that, uh, but most organizations are not for profit. And so we're, we don't have billions of dollars or millions of dollars or sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to invest in innovation and transformation. And so that really causes healthcare transformation to see some delay. And then lastly, I wanna highlight the culture. Uh, and I'll, I'll unpack this a little bit more as we go through the presentation, but many of our providers have been trained to provide care in person. That's what they feel comfortable with. That's what they feel is the best care option for their patients. And there's that, that is totally okay. But there is a shift between um, modern or newer providers that are entering into the healthcare experience that have been exposed to virtual care, that have seen what digitally enabled care looks like, and are really striving to accomplish that and provide that for their patients. And so there's this shift going on in the um, environment of how do we accomplish good care across the continuum, regardless of how that care is provided. Again, how do we transform healthcare without making folks feel like we're forcing them to take on technology that they may or may not feel comfortable with? Next, I just kind of want to highlight, this is our evolution of um, my chart and kind of that consumer health experience. So uh, when I opened up, I talked a little bit about the EHR and for many organizations, adapting an electronic health record was really that stepping stone into virtual care, that stepping stone into a digitally enabled care model. Um, I'm not going to talk through each of these points with our journey, but one of the things that I do want to highlight is that our virtual care journey really launched uh, in 2018. We launched an on-demand video visit platform. It was actually a partnership with another vendor that would uh, provide urgent care or uh, in the Bronson instance, fast care related symptoms. So your coughs, your um, flu-like symptoms, those sorts of things that are um, common. You can kind of talk through the symptoms and generally have a pretty regimented um, care, care path for. So that was really when we started digging into this. Uh, we also expanded into some of our sleep health and specialty areas, as well as began piloting with some of our primary care areas. Um, and then to 2020 hit and everything just exploded in relation to the virtual care delivery. Uh, but it also was a pivotal moment in shifting consumer expectations when it comes to virtual care, as well as their digital patient journey. 
uh, folks were scheduling their uh, screening or testing appointments online. We then took that and, and uh, did the vaccination clinics that were online scheduled. Um, and so we really had to think differently on how we were able to interact with and deliver on the care expectations that were set forth in front of us. Um, I touched a little bit on telehealth. Um, I can tell you that for many weeks, we were doing over 50% of our visits virtually. Uh, we were only seeing what we needed to see in the office physically. Uh, and so that really was a great culture shift uh, for both our providers and our patients. And so since then, we've really been just building on that with that virtual care optimization, bringing digital interactions to the inpatient setting, and then focusing this year on that patient experience and usability tools. And when you look across the industry, the way that we have approached this in our journey is very reflective of the overall culture of the healthcare industry as a whole. So while certain organizations definitely excel, uh, we are you know, kind of middle of the pack and we do better in some areas and not so great in others. Uh, but this is really uh, speaking to where transformation is happening in the industry. So next, I just kind of want to highlight, um, I mentioned that I'm going to talk about more than just telehealth. And so why are we looking to transform healthcare um, and what's kind of going on out there? So 50% of healthcare providers um, are investing in some sort of robotic process. So this could be in the surgery settings or other types of settings across the healthcare care continuum. So we need to be thinking about how that robotic process or how that automation is going to change the work that we need to do. Again, we don't want to replace a current process with, a, with just a different tool. We want to think more broadly and figure out where can we create efficiencies and do things differently, do them better. We also know that there are a ton of people connected and devices connected in the internet. Um, so whether that's your, your uh, medical devices, your wearable devices, your mobile phones, all of those things are plugged in. And so that gives us a great opportunity to transform how we're staying connected to our patients, how we're making sure that um, beyond our four walls, we're taking good care of our communities and our patient population. We also know that digital voice assistants uh, are out there. I don't know about you all, but I'm guessing a few of you have either an Alexa or a Google in your room with you today. Uh, and so how do we leverage that to really help, help patients stay connected and be able to get the information that they need that's relevant to their healthcare? I think we've all had situations where we've wanted to Google our symptoms and figure out what, what kind of situation is going on. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're directing those in a helpful and meaningful manner. And so being aware of what's going on in the industry forces us to really, again, transform healthcare. Lastly, AI, and we'll unpack AI a little bit later as well. Um, but AI is going to truly force us to evolve how we train, how we provide care, um, whether it be chatbots or if it is how we are having our providers write our notes or patients being able to ask questions and receive um, healthcare specific feedback on that. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there that we're going to continue to see push healthcare in the, in the right direction. So this is just a really great graphic that I truly enjoy that I think captures uh, why transformation in healthcare is so important. So on the left hand side, we have kind of that traditional what we call front doors or how our patients are accessing our system. So most folks are either coming through our emergency department or going to a physical clinic and the emergency department or hospital for a planned admission kind of the same. Um, but there's really those intentional care paths where you're saying, I choose this health system for these two functions, either my hospital care or my clinic care. And what's happening across the industry is there are a slew of new front doors that are opening. Um, so whether it's things that are partnered with payers, such as with Optum or CVS Health, or we have what's called direct primary care, where those those organizations are standing up specifically to provide primary care, um, which is good in some senses and has some barriers in others, but either way it's going to disrupt how our patients and how our organizations function. 
We also have retail or urgent care clinics. Um, if you follow the news, CVS and Walgreens have been all over with how they're planning to uh, really integrate these into those one-stop shops for what you need. Walmart's also done an excellent job in that space um, and has really low cost alternatives to some of the traditional healthcare backed um, options. And then lastly, on the right hand side, we have kind of a slew of virtual care. I read somewhere that uh, investment in telehealth related apps since 2020 has gone up over 300, I think it was 300,000 percent. So there was billions and billions of dollars that was invested into virtual care in response to 2020. Those options are really going to start disrupting some of our patient profiles and again, evolving what that patient expects when it comes to virtual care. For example, Amazon Care has been a option that's available to, to patients with Amazon Prime. Um, that solution is available for a set price with select diagnoses. Now we have a national option that local small organizations are going to have to respond to and stay competitive with because I don't know about you, but Amazon is a pretty streamlined experience in my opinion. And so how are we adapting our technology, our experience to really deliver on those national brands? This is another summary that I think just brings it um, to circle, um, full circle, is really, again, we, we think about organizations or hospital-centric uh, bricks and mortar facilities as we sometimes refer to them. But again, we have these other disruptors that are really focused on other primary functions, your Walmarts, your CVS Health, but are now addressing healthcare specific needs. And as you get to those um, different solutions, you'll, you'll see that they are more consumer centric because as a hospital system, we've been focused on taking care of you as a patient, as a consumer of our services, which have been healthcare centric. Now we have folks that are really, really good at taking care of patients or taking care of your needs um, outside of the healthcare setting and are very good at understanding you as a buyer or you as a consumer of their goods and then they're adapting what they're offering to make sure that they're delivering on those consumer expectations. Um, again, in the virtual care space, Teladoc is one of those um, primary ones that you hear a lot in that industry. So I want to just kind of pause and level set with what we're seeing here um, as far as transformation of the consumer expectations. So take a moment to just think about some of these topics. So when we used to think about scheduling an appointment back in 20, let's go back to 2000. So not even, you know, about 20 years ago, when you were going to schedule your appointment, what were you gonna do? More often than not, you were gonna pick up the phone and call to speak to someone. Or in some cases, you just had a reminder that was mailed to you with a date and time of your next appointment. Fast forward to future state. Our consumers are expecting that they can schedule their own appointments, reschedule their own appointments online 24 seven, 365. If you call our patients, in some cases, they are not going to answer that phone call. They're going to let you go to voicemail and they're gonna look for an option to reply back to you at a later time with the digital means. When it comes to seeking care advice, this has been a really hot topic lately. Historically, again, as a patient, you would call the clinic and you would either talk to uh, the front desk or an MA, and then they would relay that to the provider. In some day, you know, not so many years ago, folks used to just drop into the clinic. Hey, I'm not feeling good. Can you work me in today? Gone are those days. Now patients are really looking for chatbot options to be able to message with their providers real time. Um, I'll tell you from experience, we see patient messages where if we're expanding, you know, if we're going more than two hours without replying to a patient message, we're getting a, hey, did you see my message? And that just really has to come down to some of those um, consumer profiles and the, the generational gaps that we see as, transform, as healthcare is transforming. This has also changed for getting results. Again, we used to wait for that phone call and then we would get that mailed letter and then maybe have some more questions and call the clinic back. 
current state, we release those real time. Our patients are seeing these before our providers are seeing them. And then they want a message and have a real time dialogue about what those results mean. Lastly, after that visit, we're looking at how you paid your bill. Again, this used to be mailed to you and we would get a check back in the mail. Now the, those are electronic statements and patients are using digital wallets or other saved payment options to make those payments. So again, this isn't digital transformation in the sense of really changing what's happening, but it's definitely adapting to the way that we are trying to deliver on those consumer expectations. So what's influencing our patients? I used the Amazon example earlier. We, as an organization, had a digital think tank session that we held last year. We met with over 50 people across the organization. We said, who does digital well? Every single session, top of the list, Amazon. They have a seamless experience, one touch pay. They surface up the things that are relevant to you based on information that they've gathered as you for you as a consumer. It is a very top-notch experience for, for consumers. And now patients are expecting that when they come into a healthcare setting. On the left-hand side, I know it's a little bit small, but that's um, an app called One Table or Open Table. Um, and this was really exploded with COVID um, precautions again. Uh, folks were doing a lot of to-go orders and making sure that they had reservations if they were going out. And so that ability to pick a date and time and location for your services, again, just re-emphasizes how consumers are expecting to interact with the healthcare system. And then in the lower section there, I have that curbside pickup. I can't tell you how many people are excited about the fact that you don't have to go into Walmart anymore and you can just order online. Same thing with Meijer. But how do we transform that in healthcare? Folks are expecting to wait in their car or get a shipment to their home with what they need. Um, so things like RX refills is an area that patients are now almost expecting a mail delivery or a home delivery of those goods instead of needing to go out and get them. Um, so all of these things are really influencing how we need to deliver a different kind of healthcare experience to our patients. In the lower right hand side, um, this is just an industry comparison. You'll see uh, Amazon referenced there a couple times. Uh, banking apps are another big one. So JP Morgan's on there a couple times as well. But it talks about how uh, healthcare industries have now adapted those types of good consumer experiences that are out of industry and modeled them at their organization. So things like one touch experiences using AI and chatbots, uh, how the app looks and feels, all of those things influence how our patients are expecting their care journey to look and feel these days. And I promised I would get to generational things. Uh, so this is a really great understanding and breakdown of what's making up our population these days. Um, this is not my graphic. Um, some of the descriptions are a little interesting. Uh, but I think it does a really good job capturing who is making up our portfolio of patients. And so you can see that we have a lot of folks that are in kind of that silent generation and are expecting that more traditional healthcare experience, as are that boomer generation. But what we find when we look at the data is that those actually tend to be some of our most engaged folks. They have adapted to the technology and they're vocal when it doesn't meet their expectations. And then we get into the growing areas of Gen X and the millennials. These folks are getting very accustomed to what they expect with a healthcare experience based on all of those influencers they've seen their whole life. And then we really get into those, uh, you know, the 10 to 15 year olds, those Gen Zers. They grew up with technology. I can't tell you how many times I've watched our daughter, who's almost 18 years old, um, try to adapt when technology isn't a solution for her. Um, and so we're really starting to get into that area of we're making this shift to needing to deliver on virtual care. We need to deliver 
um, personalized apps. We need to deliver on how you search for us and how we provide you the information that you're expecting to see as a patient. Uh, and this, again, will continue to evolve and shift as years go by, uh, but it's so important for us to understand why folks have those expectations. And it's not gonna be too many years until those digital natives are really the, the core of healthcare transformation demand. Um, and as we know, healthcare transformation is slow rolling. So hopefully we'll be able to get um, that dial shift fast enough so that we can meet those expectations in the future. So now that I've kind of laid the foundation of what's kind of been moving us in the right direction, I would be amiss if I didn't say that moving healthcare into a transformative um, state is not without its challenges. We know that patients have high expectations. What, they, what matters most to them is still, in most cases, not that digital experience, again, depending upon the generation. But what's really interesting to me, if we look at that right graphic, uh, it's very interesting. So the patient demand is kind of this orange bubble. And you can see how the demand of the patients or the things that matter most to the patient kind of have that directional correlation. What's very interesting is almost, uh, almost on all of these, the provider adoption and vendor delivery is reversed. So if the patient has a high demand for it, we are not able to deliver on that either with, again, culture or the technology that's in our portfolio. And then opposite of that, where we're able to have a vendor that delivers on it, but perhaps it's not something that matters to our patients. And so we play this fine line of figuring out what matters most to our patients and then trying to find the dollars to invest in the technology to really move the dial and deliver on those experiences and those expectations that they're expecting from us. One of the big barriers that I'm happy to really be able to unpack this with you all today is really how we keep up with our patients being informed. So when we talk about digital literacy, this is one topic that through um, the last several years have been front of mind for a lot of folks that are focused on equity and um, you know, keeping our, com our communities informed and healthy. We have what's called digital literacy. So this is really the ability to use technology, find what you're looking for, use it to do the things that you need to do. Um, it's both cognitive, so how you're able to think through those processes, as well as technical skills. So being able to use the laptop or being able to navigate on your mobile phone. And then we get into digital health literacy, which is even more complicated because it's under that umbrella of digital literacy, but it is more focused on how do you research things in relation to healthcare? How are you able to navigate finding a provider or using a patient portal? Or the, the um, recent focus on telehealth appointments. How are we able to get our patients to be able to understand how to connect to the technology in order to receive care virtually? All of those things are huge barriers in our fundamental to overcoming some of the challenges that a uh, healthcare transformation as well as virtual care adoption face. We also know that there are digital inequities or you'll sometimes hear this referred to as what we call the digital divide. Um, sometimes I hear it the digital separation if we're trying to be a little bit more soft about it, but it really refers to those economic and educational and socio-cultural disparities um, that come from having limited access and exposure to technology. Uh, we know that in, in, in our area, in our communities, there are subsets of populations that don't have access to the fundamental technologies that we have come to almost expect or need in order to have a connected care experience. And so a lot of intentional work needs to go behind educating our patients, doing what we can to make sure that they know what the right resources are to use to research their symptoms, 
knowing how we break down some of those barriers around broadband or again technology. Uh, one of the, the great equation across the bottom is really, do you have the access to the things that you need? Do you have the knowledge how to use them? And then do you have the tools in place or the interoperability? So broadband, internet, those sorts of things, the infrastructure there to be able to connect everything so that we can have digital equity for all of our patients. Um, I wanna just stop here and, and really hone in on this. And I think it's a really great example. Um, Dr. Swanson and I worked together on a project a couple of years ago um, where we, we acknowledge that there's a gap in the South Haven community. Those patients don't have access to broadband the same way that a lot of other folks do um, because of the some of the patient populations that are out there. They're also generally not going to have mobile devices or technology and large computers or laptops that they can use for virtual care delivery. And so we've actually been able to um, secure some grant money to do exactly that where we are breaking down those barriers and supplying those patients with devices and doing that intentional education to make sure that we are trying for digital equity. Uh, it is a consistent journey, no one has it mastered, but taking small steps towards that help to remove those barriers and overall improve the outcomes for our patients in our community. I also wanted to just highlight, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this was a really great study that was recently done uh, by Connected Nation, and it highlights uh, the areas across Michigan that have uh, underserved or under um, unserved uh, in relation to broadband. Uh, so you can see that South Haven and Allegan are um, part of those uh, segments that were identified as um, optimal opportunities. And as an organization, we have prioritized trying to partner with different folks across the region to help minimize these barriers. As a healthcare organization, of course, we can't necessarily invest in the infrastructure of all broadband, um, but we are trying to do our part to help minimize those barriers. Uh, and I think it's just a really cool way to acknowledge that there are barriers and then take one step forward towards addressing them. Um, on the right hand side, just a few stats to kind of help emphasize uh, the, the magnitude of some of these barriers. So 61% of physicians in the survey found that the lowest, that um, low digital literacy was actually the biggest challenge to them being able to provide telehealth. Um, this came just behind um, actual lack of accessing the technology. So imagine if we could give every patient, if every patient could have at least a mobile device or a tablet, that means that even if we give them the technology, if we fix the broadband issue, we still have a gap with 61% of our patients not being able to understand how to use that technology or how to interact with it or understand what the information means. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to my healthcare, I wanna know what it means. And so we have a big gap that we need to continue to work towards. And again, use transformational mindset of how do we deliver on educating our patients and overcoming that digital literacy gap. We also know that um, training would be a huge thing for some of our non-English speaking patients. We do our best to account for language barriers um, and uh, different languages across um, healthcare continuum. Again, we have lots of regulating agencies that tell us what we need to do, uh, but, but meeting them where they're at and really making sure that we're investing in their education of healthcare literacy is very important. Um, and then again, I talked about that technology barrier a little bit, so I'm gonna skip over that last stat. Uh, so where have we been and where are we going? So this is a great snapshot of healthcare trends over the last couple of years. I've touched on a lot of these points, but I thought it was a great summary of the different ways that healthcare has really evolved over the last several years. Um, so things that are digitally enabled tools. So most of our folks at this point have some sort of digital tool that they're using from a provider perspective 
to help deliver healthcare more easily, make it more understandable, make it more relatable, make it easier to access. That is so critical to continuing to transform how healthcare looks and feels moving forward. We also have seen a significant growth among physicians, regardless of their age, gender, and specialty. As we looked at earlier, those millennial gaps, they're not just for patients, they're also for our providers. We need to understand what those skill sets and different mentalities and that culture that those providers have to adapt what we're putting in their toolkit. So again, we can shape and transform patient care delivery. An example, across the board, all of our providers have the option to do virtual care delivery here at Bronson. I can tell you that there are pockets of providers that are far more willing to adapt to virtual care delivery than others. And some of that is uh, based on specialty, some of it is based on age, and some of it is based on preference. But there is no telltale sign of which way a provider is gonna fall. And so in order for us to really transform healthcare, we need to make sure that we're being in, intentional around those options. So again, we can, we can deliver on those patient expectations. If you're expecting a virtual care visit, we wanna be able to deliver on that. And so it's really great to see that trying to continue to go upward. In the middle there, we talk about remote care tools. So in my next slide, I'm really gonna highlight what remote care can look like. Um, so much more than just televisits or virtual care visits. We really wanna unpack what remote patient monitoring uh, looks like and feels like. Uh, we also saw a great um, growth with televisits. Uh, when you look at the numbers of virtual care visits during the pandemic, it is absolutely crazy the number of visits that happened over the March, April, and May timeframe. I can tell you that most organizations have averaged out at around 10% of their care delivery remaining virtual versus that 40 to 50% we are seeing during those pandemic, um, those peak pandemic weeks. But the important part here is that enthusiasm. There is a revived hope for virtual care delivery. Uh, as I mentioned, peers have been a barrier for virtual care adoption in the past. And so we're really waiting to see um, how that legislation will continue to uh, support virtual care delivery. And now that we've gone almost uh, two, two and a half years uh, with virtual care enabled, we've been able to prove that virtual care is a sound practice. It is a way that patients want to be cared for. And we're still able to deliver on the quality outcomes, sometimes better by implementing some of these other technologies in correlation with virtual care. And lastly, uh, making sure that the adoption of technologies uh, is high, but what we're continuing to work towards and, and um, us as an organization as well are in this bucket, utilization is somewhat low. So we have folks that are engaged, they're plugging in the technology, they're seeing this demand for solutions like AI and chatbots but are they using them? Are they making the most out of those tools? And what this tells us is we're getting there. We have the foundation in place. And when you think back to our EHR journey that I presented at the beginning, you can see that it's been a slow journey, right? We implemented our electronic health record back in 2012, and it's really taken us till 2023. So almost 10 years for us to circle back and say, great, we have the tool, we've got patients to sign up for it, now let's make it better. And it's just that slow progression that we need to continue to make to really transform how healthcare looks and feels in the future. So next I wanted to um, unpack just a few different segments of digital health across the care continuum. So remote patient monitoring is one of those areas that is a broad concept that includes a lot of different things in it. And so in definition, it's really just a healthcare delivery that uses technology to gather your information outside of a traditional healthcare setting. So in a sense, virtual care kind of falls into remote patient monitoring. But generally what we see with remote patient monitoring is it's more digitally enabled than that. 
it's patients that have mobile devices that are connected with, say, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. It's patients that have a smart scale and are able to collect their scale weights and have them sync to an app on their phone or go into their health kit. Those are some of the things that are the foundation of remote patient monitoring. But what we saw over the last several years is this has exploded. If you go into uh, Best Buy these days, you can actually get a kit. It's called the Tito Care Kit. It's about $300. And it has a um, stethoscope, it has a few different tools in there that are all connected to an app that you can then use to assist you and assist your provider with seeing you and hearing you just like if you were in the office. They can hear your heartbeat. They can look in your ear if you're having um, ear issues. Uh, there are several other things in that kit. And this is really, again, moving us beyond just a virtual visit where you're talking with the provider through video. We're able to do more assessments. We're able to really connect that, that inpatient care experience while being miles and miles apart. The graphic on the right-hand side just kind of shows how the um, number of users of remote patient monitoring has steadily grown and is projected to grow in the coming years. Um, but you can see that it's kind of leveling out. And again, we, we expected this coming out of 2020, that this would be the trend. Uh, but the important part is we are going to continue to see more and more adoption of remote patient monitoring across our user base. Uh, so that is remote patient monitoring. I'm going to share um, a quick video because um, I don't think it's going to load here the way I need it to. So let me just get this going on my other screen and pull it right down for you. And this is from Mayo Health. I am not biased. And this is a great video that just does a cute little snapshot of what remote patient monitoring looks like. Mrs. Lee was recently discharged from the hospital. Her doctor ordered remote patient monitoring equipment to be delivered so Mrs. Lee can track her vitals at home. She's been on the program for about a week and a half when the remote monitoring nurse notices that Mrs. Lee gained five pounds in two days. She calls Mrs. Lee to ask about this weight gain and finds that Mrs. Lee has questions regarding the dosage of her prescribed diuretic medication. The nurse explains Mrs. Lee's medications and diet protocol. With her new understanding, Mrs. Lee's weight quickly returns to an acceptable range. Mrs. Lee's participation in the remote monitoring program has assisted her in avoiding a clinic visit and potential ED visit. Remote patient monitoring provides monitoring and support at home to help patients reach their healthcare goals. So with that in mind, um, this is, again, a very basic uh, example of what remote patient monitoring can look like. But when you think about the impact this can have, if we can keep you at home and help you stay healthy or get healthy, we know that care outcomes are better when you're surrounded by those that can take care of you and help you feel better. But also when you're in a home situation where you're in a comfortable surrounding, um, we have what we affectionately call white coat syndrome that oftentimes affects our patients' vitals when we're doing even just a BP check and they come into the clinic. What we're finding is that when we have those patients take their BP readings at home, they're far more accurate and they do actually reflect the rates that the patients are telling us and logging in their home um, journals. So remote patient monitoring is very impactful in that sense. And, and when it's paired well with a virtual care program and delivered um, in a meaningful way, it really has the opportunity to transform how healthcare looks and feels. Um, in that graphic that we looked at, we talk about the care continuum and, and we really wanna think about healthcare systems no longer as that hospital-based system. We are thinking about healthcare from a sense of community health. What can we do to keep our community healthy and meet patients where they're at? 
And remote patient monitoring is just a fabulous example about how we can go above and beyond to do that. So next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about AI. And you might be saying, AI, why are we talking about artificial intelligence and healthcare? But artificial intelligence is a very, very powerful tool that across settings, again, when we look at how healthcare needs to transform, we're thinking about the things of how is AI powering other consumer interactions and how is it benefiting other organizations and what can healthcare learn from that? So we need to continue to evolve and adapt how we're using this. And again, when I talk about transformation, I'm talking about more than just um, the patient experience. That is so much of what this is, but it also is that provider interaction. So let me give you an example. When you walk into the doctor's office and you're having your clinical visit, how much of the time during that visit is your provider looking at you and talking to you? Now in the days of an EHR, um, where we're documenting electronically on those computers. I can almost guarantee that interaction with your provider changed when we put technology in place. We acknowledge that that experience may not be the same or as desirable. And so how can we integrate AI to really transform that experience? How Bronson is approaching this is a tool that we call Hey Epic. So Gone are the days of your provider staring at their computer screen or typing at it. Your provider will be able to walk in the room and say, hey, Epic, I'm seeing John Smith today. He's here for lower back pain. And the patient can just now talk to the provider and the patient or the tool in the background is actually going to be able to listen to that visit and document all of the pieces that are pertinent for the provider while they're just having a conversation with the patient instead of being focused on the technology in the room. I know that's scary. I know AI is a sensitive topic, but imagine how that can transform that, that experience into something so much more. We also can see this from the patient perspective. Almost all consumers at this point have been on some sort of website that has a chat bot that's enabled. You know, the little pop-up that says, hi, how can I help you today? Those tools are becoming an expectation of the consumer. And by having AI power that tool, we can help not only meet those customer demands, but also use those uh, experiences to improve digital health literacy. We can use those methodical ways of educating and using resources to empower our patients to help reduce some of those barriers that I highlighted earlier. Uh, on the screenshot in the lower left uh, is a brief video that talks about chat GPT. If you haven't heard of chat GPT, I guarantee you're going to hear about it in the future. It is a mind blowing tool that is able to um, answer really any question you can think of. So for example, you can write in there, uh, how would I treat a sprained ankle? Now you can type this in Google today, right? And you'll get a series of pop-ups that'll tell you, um, you know, different things that you might be able to do. Uh, probably WebMD would be at the top of the list of those results. But what ChatGPT does is it is pulling from a full database that's even more robust than that singular resource to compile all of that information. So instead of returning the one result, it'll say something like, according to the majority of available resources, here are the top three things you can do. And then that tool will prompt you, did they answer your question or can I help with something else? So from a patient perspective, this is a very powerful tool. We can also use it on the provider side to start using something like this to write our notes or um, you know, really advise what type of different uh, care models we could use for various patients. So imagine you have a, uh, a, a unique type of cancer that you're recently diagnosed with. 
your provider can use a tool like this to scan multiple sources and start gathering information. Again, we rely on providers to use their clinical expertise, but it is putting the information in the hands of the provider. So I encourage you to go out and um, watch a brief video and chat GPT if you haven't already um, seen it in the news or heard about it. All right. Uh, this one looks like it's going to play. Let me, yeah, let's see if this one will play. So this is actually a um, interesting segue into my last topic that I'm going to cover. It bridges how AI and uh, some of those modern healthcare experiences can come together. And I think it does a really nice job summarizing it. So let's go ahead and take a look. Maybe. Hold on, let me get it over here on the other screen. Get it nice and big. And we'll watch three seconds of it. So we're looking at the uh, OHSU Health Command Center. This NASA style center at OHSU was just added a couple years ago. The capacity snapshot, which shows us the uh, available beds. To keep it simple, it uses artificial intelligence to make sure there are enough beds for incoming patients across four hospitals, OHSU, Dornbecker, Hillsborough Medical Center, and Adventist Health Portland. It's staffed 24 seven. Think air traffic control, just for hospitals. This one shows all the patients that are waiting to be placed in beds. In 2016, OHSU turned away more than 500 people because of a lack of beds. We are declining way too many patients. But with this system in place streamlining who comes and goes. This last year we declined 400 fewer patients. The tech used here can also use real-time data from patients already getting treated in the hospital to predict up to a week out if beds will be available. It's this type of intuitive technology that's helping people get better care at OHSU. Steve Brown, who is a futurist, predicts there will be more of this type of AI tech in the coming years. Use AI to help them give a higher quality of care. Brown says in the future, fewer people will be going to the hospital because more people will be using things like telehealth, where they get health care through a phone or screen. To communicate and manage my health remotely, without having to go physically into a doctor's office. And that's the next step for doctors here at OHSU who want to develop what they're calling a virtual hospital. Dr. Matthias Merkel at OHSU is one of the doctors who is helping plan the virtual hospital program. The virtual hospital is really a vehicle where we can bring the clinical expertise to the patient. So let's say you live in a rural area, are having a health issue, and your local doctor needs more input. You can get on a video chat with a specialist at OHSU who works with your doctor in real time to figure out the best treatment. You get the care you need and avoid a road trip to the big hospital. It is a component of what you would describe as Skype, but it's also combined with uh, machine learning, with predictive algorithm. What Dr. Merkel means by predictive algorithm is that in addition to the video link, artificial intelligence may help in any diagnosis because it can scan millions of medical patterns and offer doctors possible causes of why you aren't feeling well. It doesn't replace us, it just makes us better. This whole virtual hospital idea is still a handful of years away, but more and more technology plus artificial intelligence are already helping doctors here at OHSU and across the country be more proactive. So it's a lot to unpack in that video, uh, but I think it does a, a good job bringing together the AI, but also introducing some really unique concepts such as that virtual hospital, and um, this video is from a couple years ago, so you can hear uh, the discussion that it'll um, help perk up the interest of virtual care, and I think we've already crossed that road, uh, but it brings up the concept of virtual hospitals as well, which is something that we are seeing as a trend in healthcare, and, and it is a very transformative way uh, to care for our patients, whether we're sending them home sooner, such as what we were able to do with some COVID-19 patients, uh, and then monitor them from home, or with the virtual care model, it truly is 
hey, you have this set diagnosis that we've said is okay to manage from home. Why don't you go home where you can um, have your loved ones help support you and be more comfortable? And we'll continue to monitor you 24 seven in that command center type view and send you those virtual visits um, for us to stay connected and provide you any updates or escalations as needed. Uh, so those are all concepts that are really transforming how healthcare looks and feels, whether you're coming on site or if you're getting that care in your home. So if you do come on site, I, I would be amiss if I didn't talk about what that modern healthcare experience looks like. Uh, we are starting to do some of those things in the space of virtual care, so consults. Uh, one great example of virtual care in the hospital setting is the uh, telestroke uh, option. So instead of having um, our stroke providers uh, physically on site at each of our hospitals, we're able to do a telestroke um, consult with those providers. So if a uh, stroke situation arises at one of our off sites at an off hour, uh, we are able to immediately connect that patient and that care team to the expert to be able to advise and give that clinical expertise real time. That's transforming how we do healthcare. It's transforming what that experience looks like. We also have a lot of different ways that healthcare is expanding. 3D printing. I never thought I would see 3D printing on a modern healthcare experiences slide, but I can tell you, uh, again, I, I don't want to keep hitting um, on the pandemic, but uh, there was a huge uptick in how we were able to use what we had in order to meet needs. So something as simple as being able to print um, mask uh, the straps so that folks didn't have the irritation from the, uh, the, the paper masks was a innovative way that people were using 3D printers in response to that. Uh, we also are seeing 3D printing for things like prosthetics and different types of splints across the industry. So all of this is changing how we're able to deliver this and sometimes offer it at a lower cost or a, um, a more efficient uh, option with less supply chain issues. I've talked about wearable technology in the upper middle section there. Uh, this is great. Um, you know, we talked about wearables and those sorts of things, but there's also things that we're able to do when the patient is on site to make sure that we're monitoring them and keeping informed to make those medical interventions as quickly as possible in situations such as with that uh, command center, we would be able to see if a patient physically had left their bed, but they are uh, supposed to stay in the bed those sorts of things. We also have things like that portable monitor. So making sure that we're able to take care of our patients wherever the providers are at. A tool called Rover is something that we have available that's able to um, put our nurses, because if you've been in an inpatient bed, you know that our nurses are never standing still. They are always going from room to room to room. And so for them to be able to interact with and keep things up to date from a mobile device is a huge win. Take it one step further and put that hey epic experience in that nursing situation just got that much easier because their device, they now no longer need to pull it out. Um, but they can again use that AI powered interaction to really streamline how they're getting and providing the documentation that they need. So those are all things that are going to continue to morph and evolve how healthcare looks and feels moving forward. We also need to talk about what that looks like on the go. So many of you, uh, I'm sure, have experienced the MyChart app. Um, that is one of the fundamentals of how we connect with patients here at Bronson. Um, and I originally had at home as the title above that slide, but it's really on the go. Um, being connected with our patients and having patient portals is one of the best ways for us to be able to uh, use those transformative interactions such as virtual care visits or using um, the tools such as Track My Health, which is how we integrate um, those at home devices. For example, in our pediatric cardiology unit, our little kiddos that have um, heart, heart issues are able to monitor those from home using the Track My Health. They log into my chart, 
um, and either they can input those values or we are outfitting those patients with a home kit that they can actually just sync up with their MyChart account. And then we're able to monitor those patients and make interventions earlier versus bringing them back into the clinic. So the MyChart app is so much more than just virtual care, but it, it truly helps make sure that our patients are having that digitally enabled patient experience talked a little bit about modern, um, you know, the modern healthcare experience, but that means more than just the tools in our um, caregiver toolkit. It is what does that in-room experience look and feel like for patients? So in this photo on the left hand, uh, one has what we call a foot side TV. So typically in uh, hospital rooms, there's a whiteboard that has uh, your clinical care team members' names. Well, let's, again, not just go from the whiteboard to the TV or a digital platform. Let's make it better. Let's make it interactive. Let's be able to uh, have patients ask questions and have them show up on that screen so they don't forget to ask about it the next time you're in the room. Let's have them be able to see a photo of you so they can better recognize who you are and what role you play on their care team. You can also see the tablet in the forefront of that. So how can patients interact with this? And again, we need to be cognizant of what those barriers might be for patients. Is this available in the language that they can understand? Is it able to speak to the patient if they have auditory um, deficits? Being mindful about what that experience looks like for all patients is really important. And then on the right-hand side, really looking at that clinic experience from the time of arrival, uh, you know, as a virtual care leader, I always like to think about how can I keep you home and do that virtual care delivery model. Uh, but when you do have to come to the clinics, we want that to look and feel modern. How can we change what you expect when you get to that front door, that digital front door? Uh, you know, in my example of the carry out um, or being able to have things shipped to you, I put McDonald's. Uh, I remember when McDonald's released their kiosks. So you would walk in and you would order your McDonald's um, breakfast sandwich on the kiosk, and then you would just wait for your name to be called. There was an adoption curve to that. There was folks that stood by those kiosks and instructed you what to do to help you through that experience. And now when you walk in, there's hardly no one in line. Folks are either doing it online or at the kiosk. And so again, how can we deliver on those consumer expectations and truly transform what healthcare delivery looks like in the future? So with that, I wanna just leave you with a couple quotes. Uh, I'm a Jillian Michaels fan. Uh, so I uh, hear this quote quite regularly in her different uh, workout DVDs, but transformation isn't a future event. It's a present day activity. We need to continue to focus on what we can change today so that we can meet what we're expecting in the future. Uh, you know, I talked about the Gen, the Gen Xers and some of those uh, young, young kiddos that are gonna be the consumers of healthcare in the coming years. How can we make sure that what we're doing today is setting us up for success in the future? And then the other one is by um, Edward Stemming. Transformation is not automatic. <laughs> it must be learned and it must be led. Uh, surrounding yourself with folks that are willing to take the plunge is what makes transformation happen. It is intentional. It is hard work. It is ever evolving. There is no certainty in transformation. Um, one of the concepts that we regularly say when we have transformational or mind shift type uh, projects that we're presenting is, getting folks comfortable with failure and looking at failure as an opportunity to learn is so critical to continuing to do true digital transformation in the healthcare care setting. Um, you know, virtual care, for example, was such a concept that folks were so afraid to take a step forward with it, but we tried it. We were forced to try it. And what we found is that it works. And so how do we continue to take those small leaps to really figure out how we continue to push forward and deliver on those ongoing and ever evolving expectations of our consumers.
So with that, that is the last of what I have formally prepared for you all today. I hope you are full of questions and I look forward to um, answering any questions. Thank you, Kayla. Happy to, to work uh, as Richard's getting his camera unmuted or his mic's unmuted. I'll ask if there are any questions that anyone would like to share. You're welcome to come off mute and address us yourself. Uh, the first question I'll just start, Kayla, as we're waiting for some to come in is, which of these innovations that you described uh, actually ended up being the easiest for you and your team to implement as, as well as easiest for patients to, to adopt? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, one of the things that I think was uh, very well received um, by patients was actually our remote monitoring or the ability to track vitals at home. Uh, it wasn't as challenging from a technology standpoint to stand it up, uh, but it was one of the tools that patients were really looking for and we wanted to be able to deliver on. And so when we were able to uh, integrate with uh, the health kits and various other tools, it was definitely well received by the patients. And most providers were really receptive to it as well. So I think that would be one that I think would, would be a good one to highlight. Kayla, there is one <clears throat> aspect of healthcare as a clinician that I'm concerned about. I think this is fantastic. All this is fantastic. I, I learned so much today. But there was an old saying, high tech, high touch. And I have seen with my patients that all of these things are great. I mean, you keep them intellectually, but emotionally and psychologically, there's still some barriers to all of this. The patient doesn't feel as connected. And we have to figure out ways of doing that because you know the physical touch has been shown to be so important. I don't know how to implement that plus all of this because this is going to make healthcare so much more exciting. Yeah, thanks for those remarks. And I think, again, it's a continual evolution. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, again, I, I, um, my role switched into telehealth leadership uh, just as the pandemic was kind of happening. And so, uh, to start doing research, I was like, how do you do a virtual care assessment, you know, virtually? How do you actually assess a patient and be able to make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they were included in that assessment and that the care wasn't, um, the care level wasn't jeopardized because of that virtual care delivery? I don't think there's a one um, stop answer because I think it depends on provider. I think it depends on patient, uh, but it definitely is a opportunity for us to be really intentional with how those interactions look and feel. Uh, the opposite is almost uh, very true as well, as far as now that we've opened the technology floodgates, we have more touches with those patients and how do you scale that back? How do you make those interactions more meaningful and more personal than just um, feeling like a, my, you know, like a Facebook chat. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's also that mind shift and sh mindset shift and that balance between uh, that high tech, high touch, which is a thing. Uh, but again, how do you add value to those? That's a question. I think what has to happen, and I, this, I hope the, the rest of the participants here will quite move on with this, is that you may not be as many personal interactions between the nurse or the physician or the technicians as there had been in the past, but the times they are interacting personally, it has to be of great quality. And that's a very important thing to learn. Physicians have to learn how to be very, intensively interested in the patient. That's Absolutely. just my comments. I'm going to sit back and let other people ask questions. Thanks, Kayla. This has yeah. been fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Swanson. Uh, Kayla, we have a question from a uh, nursing instructor. Uh, Terry Holden asks, how will these changes affect the, edu the how we future or how we educate future healthcare professionals? Are you already getting into, into the college level and training future nurses? Yeah, that's a that's 
a really good question and I, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, you know, we talked about how uh, emerging uh, providers and, and newer folks to the uh, healthcare industry are more, uh, they expect those digital interactions and they're more comfortable with them. I do know that we uh, are working with colleges to really understand how we can transform how the education looks and feels to resemble the modern day healthcare experience that we're looking to offer. Uh, I can't speak to any of the local colleges specifically. I am not a clinical um, individual by nature, uh, but I do know that a lot of work has gone into how are curriculums being updated to really reflect uh, best practices in a virtual care setting? I know that was a, a big topic over the last few years to make sure that that was um, a fundamental piece of that education that folks were getting. Uh, so does that answer the question? Terry, if you have any follow-ups, feel free to come off mute and address them yourself. I'll, I'll I'll give her just a second to to be able to do so. Uh, in the in the meantime, Kayla, question for you relates to the experience of telemedicine from the patient side. Uh, you had mentioned the training that was required uh, in the McDonald's example that you gave. Uh, mm -hmm. But what kind of training is available for patients who don't come into the office frequently and are are looking and maybe frustrated from the current experiences they're having without that training? Sure. Yeah, this has been an area that we continue to strive for opportunities to improve. So one of the things that we uh, do have is, uh, so in our in our virtual care um, experience, we leverage our MyChart application. The virtual care is delivered through the MyChart application. And so in that, there are several tips and tricks that are included in the um, kind of pre-visit work. And we also do have the option for the patients to do kind of a test visit to get the kinks worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have implemented processes where uh, what we, we have what's called a video visit risk score. So essentially it looks to see if the patient has uh, had a video visit in the past um, so many months. So typically it's the last three months. Uh, are they my chart active because we do have the ability to do what we call direct send links so you don't need a my chart to be able to do a video visit anymore and then um, also if they have done their e check in steps which is essentially the registration that we need to have complete before we can conduct a virtual visit mm -hmm. and so our staff will leverage that virtual um, video visit score and in most cases, if a patient is uh, not passing on one of those three criteria, we'll actually do a proactive outreach to the patient and say, hey, I see that you haven't you know, been able to complete X, Y, and Z step. Is there any questions, anything I can do to help? So that by the time they're getting to the visit date and time, we've hopefully worked through any of those kinks. Now, I will fully disclose that I know that that is not the 100% uh, happens all the time, but that is one of the ways that we're trying to address and help guide the patient through that. Um, one I of the other- the, I think the home health nurse is very important too. The physical visit to help set up the equipment, which mm -hmm. I've seen for these patients who have fears and they don't know, but to have somebody physically standing there showing them how to do it makes a big difference. Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll cut out. I'll emphasize that as well, what Dr. Swanson said. The, I think one of the questions that's come up is somebody you know, like myself, I'm older now. I've been very healthy for the most part. I go for my doctor's visit once a year, but it's when somebody has something significant, an acute problem, they're stressed, they have to have several visits and they have to be continuous about that. That probably is a real trigger for concern regarding having these telehealth um, visits. You know, I mean, I know usually, hopefully a, a visiting nurse is involved with that along the way, but it's more about, when we talk about what's happened over COVID, the psychological impact of illness has a huge effect and how does that happen? I mean, you can have your counseling over the tele, and that's been improved 
But if you're dealing with a physical aspect of it that pre presents with more um, depression and that type of thing, I you know see there could be a problem with some of the interaction. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Kayla, I'll allow you if you have any comments to share there. Otherwise, I'm happy to go to the next topic. Yeah, I think those are all really great remarks, and I'll just um, I'll just add that we continue to evolve how this program looks and feels, uh, and trying to insert those education opportunities where they make sense is really important. Um, I will add that in South Haven we do actually have um, what we call like our virtual office, and so patients are actually able to come in if they. Um, if it's their first time doing a video visit or things like that, and the staff will actually help make sure that they get connected and, and assist them with through those processes. So uh, it is one small way that we're trying to meet patients where they're at um, and we continue to evolve that program. Thank you, Kayla. I, 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 oh, sorry, Richard, go ahead. I, I think Terry can address this because she's a nursing educator. The shortage of nurses is a major problem whether we have enough in the hospital or have enough for home health, but the shortage of nursing, of professional nurses is a problem. Terry, how do you, what do you suggest? Well, I think one thing is with this telehealth, I could see how it would work, but you know, in the medical schools and the nursing schools, we do a lot of simulations practice in the lab. And it'd be very interesting to bring the telehealth part into the simulation to see how well people do with it. Because you have to make these decisions, I think. You can't always do it by telehealth. Then the decision comes when we actually have to see the patient. I think those would be good practice things. And then the medical school too, you know, we use a lot of simulation. And how are we dealing with patients? When to use telehealth and when not to use it? I think it's a good thing at times, but I also, we talk about communicating and personal touch and really talking to the patient. And sometimes you find out many more things about the patient than just the diagnosis or the, or the symptoms they come in with. So I think it's something to explore to know the differentiation between using telehealth and actually having to see the patient. I think we have to work on talking, especially in the nursing profession too, and, and the medical profession, just my thoughts. Thanks, Terry. Those are those are excellent remarks. And I just want to uh, emphasize that the more we can do to prepare the up and coming future of healthcare professionals uh, to understand the pros and the benefits of virtual care, but also to understand what those limitations are, because virtual care is not a one size fits all. It is not for every diagnosis or every patient. And so empowering them to be able to make informed decisions of which conditions are good for that or what types of patients are good for that um, are good, but just make sure that you're removing biases because I think sometimes when we think of good candidates for telehealth, um, we immediately jump to certain age populations or things like that has been my experience. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize is when you look at uh, implementing some sort of program or curriculum around it, uh, being really intentional with how you can still continue to have those personal touches with patients. Uh, some of the remarks we actually get from our virtual care program is that uh, patients actually feel they received better um, interaction with their provider because it was more one-on-one. -on -one. They were able to have their full attention and even though the provider was on their computer, they were looking at the patient um, instead of, again, looking at their computer or things like um, looking at how do you do an assessment virtually or how do you help that patient um, work through an assessment of themselves. That's something we've implemented elsewhere as well. Uh, and then my last remark would be uh, related to the things you learn about the patient. Um, because virtual health is so intentional with the times that we have set aside, uh, our providers actually get really good insight into the patient's homes. Um, and in some cases, it's really, really helpful. Um, so for example, when we're doing um, post-surgical follow-ups or those sorts of things, we're able to actually see the patient's home and how they're able to navigate their steps or able to um, you know, reach for things or whatever it might be. We can see them in their home element and actually have them do those real life situations to see how they're reacting to the treatment or the intervention that we provided for them. 
Thank Ayla, you. that's a very, very important aspect. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yes, good. Thanks, Terry. I saw Thank Al Miner had, had a question earlier. I, Al, I want to come back to you before we go to another. If you'd like to unmute yourself again, you can address us. Yeah, I uh, wondered uh, how common is uh, the use of the EPIC system and what effect does uh, that have in, in uh, telemedicine? Uh, are, are you speaking of EPIC as the electronic health record or my chart as the patient portal? Well, the uh, uh, medical record, yeah. Because yeah. uh, if you don't have available the some of the testing that's historical. That's yeah. Yeah. So our EHR is used across the board. So everyone has, uh, that's kind of the platform that we have everything in. Uh, all of like the historical records are a part of that EHR. So folks can access that information straight from um, EPIC itself. And then all of that information is also available in the patient portal for folks to be able to see um, in reference and utilize for any kind of care delivery, whether it's virtual or in person. Does that answer the question? Well, I'm, I'm wondering if you're talking about purely remote. When I was in the Upper Peninsula when we were mm -hmm. trying to do some of this work, and uh, one of the problems was uh, different platforms and interfaces. And sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So all of our systems feed into EPIC, which is our core EHR. So we don't have any of those data inconsistencies between multiple EHR systems or multiple vendors. Everything is either in EPIC or feeds into EPIC. Okay. But so you're Kayla, more local. Al, excuse me. The Al's problem is, is I think, very, very interesting. You and your EPIC system may not communicate with, others. let's say, other EPIC systems or other systems around the country. That has still not been solved. And so the, the and I see this now among physicians, there's lack of collegiality and about sharing data even outside that system. If you have a physician, a family doctor who is not associated with spectrum or, or here or there, sometimes they get left out. And I think Al's point is that the epics are great, but you have to communicate outside of that closed box. Yeah, thanks for that summary, Dr. Swanson. Uh, I'll just remark that uh, we do also participate in uh, data sharing with various um, standard platforms. And so for things like it's called Micker, so our immunizations are sent there. Uh, and we also use, uh, it's called um, Care Equality is the, the uh, framework that we utilize that essentially our records can be stored up into that framework and then pulled down to additional EHRs. So for example, uh, here in Bronson, at Bronson, we have Borges as a community, you know, also serves our community. And so having that cohesive record is really important. And so we are able to is, but having that collaboration and agreeing upon those standards is definitely uh, a continued barrier that needs to be addressed, um, especially for those smaller sites that have uh, maybe non standardized uh, ways that they're documenting um, or that that information is able to be shared. Yeah, that is correct. But <clears throat> I think it comes down to sometimes we physicians don't know how to interact between the various systems. So there's some training for us. Yeah, great point. Thank you for the question, Alan. Thank you for, for the responses there. Uh, last question that, that's come to us via chat, Kayla, is from Mike. Uh, sharing a personal anecdote here, I know doctors that have retired early because of hospital systems and their time-consuming nightmares. Uh, do administrative chores increase with telehealth? I feel you. I've sat through many of those conversations and, and I value all of those provider feedback um, opportunities. Uh, 
I, I don't think that telehealth in and of itself has been a catalyst to that. Uh, I think more so the catalyst from telehealth might just be, are they willing to learn a different care delivery approach more so than the increase in administrative tasks caused by telehealth? Uh, one of the uh, pieces that I do know from a virtual care delivery model that has caused some concern and definitely some pause from providers uh, is actually what I highlighted as our, our easiest implementation was the, the track my health or that kind of home vitals tracking uh, because of the uh, notifications going to the provider. And if I have these vitals, what am I supposed to do with them? And how much time is it going to take for me to be able to review them or seek intervention on them? Uh, so that is one area of virtual care that has uh, the potential to increase that burden. But at the same time, there is now coding. Um, it is a service that we can now charge back to most payers. So there is a, a compensation model for that increased task load. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. To Mike, uh, from a physician, telehealth really didn't increase my time. It, it's the same as I was sitting, if I was sitting in the office with a patient, it's the electronic health records, some of that data that increases the time, but telehealth itself doesn't really increase the amount of time you spend. Actually, it allows you to spend more time with the patient. Thank you, Richard. Those are all the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, I would uh, encourage anyone else who has any questions to come off mute now to share those. Uh, and seeing none, Richard, I will pass it off to you to close us out. Thank you, Ian. Kayla, you've, you've taught me a whole lot, and I thought I knew a lot, and I hope the rest of our audience has learned a lot. And to me, I, I'm getting older, so it, all this is very scary because uh, I'm old man, but it is exciting because it tells us that we can do a better job as physicians. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you from HASP and thank you from me. Thank you, it was my pleasure. I did put my contact information up. So if anyone has any questions or feedback or uh, you know, as you're working through the, the virtual care, integrating that into the coursework, I would be happy to help with any kind of questions or feedback on that piece as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you so much for having me. I, I really hope that there were some uh, golden nuggets that you're able to pull out oh. and learn um, along the way. There's no question, Kayla, that there's been, there was a lot of nuggets passed out there. So <laughs> it will soak in and it'll come back slowly but surely to all of our audience. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Kayla. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Again, if you have any questions, you can contact the HASP office, and please feel free to complete the HASP course evaluation when you receive it in the email shortly. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Kayla. Take care. Thank Goodbye. You.